Thank you. So we are continuing our the study of uh, uh, the first chapter of, uh, of my book, and we have so far walked through the Old Testament, and so we're going to focus on uh, some aspects of the New Testament. And again, as you can see, it's, uh, you cannot write everything, so this is kind of an abridged summary, in a summary format, some of the things that you can read on your own. Uh, and so we're going to touch on a few of um, the salient or important um, uh, items in the New Testament. If you recall, when we started with the uh, Old Testament, and let me read that on the very first page, page five. If you go to page five, the uh, last line, we talked about the different genre, different types of literature in the Old Testament. And so uh, if I read that, because um, I want us to know that the same thing repeats in the New Testament as well. And so the books of the Old Testament were written in the ancient languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. Moreover, the Bible incorporates a diversity of genre or types of literature, including law or instruction or teaching, history, prophecy, poetry, hymns and psalms, drama, apocalyptic imagery, or apocalypse, as we call it, wisdom, gospels, and, of course, letters that we are going to look at in the New Testament. And so it's not just one monolithic kind of literature or book, because quite often when we read the, the Bible, we think, well, the Bible is just God's word and it's just one, one, one book or one type of writing. But the Bible incorporates all kinds of, of writing, all kinds of, of things that um, uh, help us to know God better and also help us to appreciate the, the profundity, the diversity uh, of God uh, as our creator and redeemer. Similarly, the New Testament also has that. And so if we go to page 23, uh, the New Testament, NT, let me read the first line, uh, and then again, that will put uh, everything in perspective for us as we get in. Page 23, the New Testament is a collection of 27 disparate documents, different, each of which was originally written to stand on its own. All the books are about Jesus, but Jesus himself did not write anything for us. He didn't produce any documents that contained you know, his own self-revelation. In fact, Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God, which represented the core of his ministry, did not depend on writing. So let me step out of this book and explain a little bit about what I mean by that. You know, everything in the Bible began with what we call oral history, orality. Everything was passed on by word of mouth. Now, I can identify with that coming from a primary culture in Ghana. That, you know, everything, it, it began, it's the same everywhere, you know, around the world. The same here in America before even the invention of the printing press. So everything was passed on or down by word of mouth. Somebody may ask, so how could they contain the core of the stories that were passed down or passed on. Well, if you come from where I come from, you notice that there are people we call the sages, the matriarchs, the patriarchs, these seasoned men and women who keep the story intact. What we know is stories gather what we call accretions or enlargements. As they go, you know, you say something to, I say something to Larry, before it gets to tree, the core of what I said to Larry will be lost. There will be all kinds of additions. So people ask the question, how can we be sure that the Bible's story is intact? Well, I, I can say for sure that having lived in the primary culture and close to that culture, I can tell you that it's possible. That the core, the gem of the stories that are passed um, or down or handed usually you know, kind of keep that um, you know, main point. And so the same thing before the Bible was actually you know, put down you know, uh, uh, in writing for us. Uh, and when the Bible was written, again, as we, especially the New Testament, we know that Jesus himself didn't write anything for us. And so what we read in the Bible written by, you know, those uh, apostles or disciples who were moved by the Holy Spirit, and we, we will talk a little bit about how did the writing process 
you know, even come about? And how was it? Um, you know, Jesus' words, his actions, his deeds were recorded by those who wrote these uh, things down, you know, for us. The good thing about the New Testament is that we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic. And the word synoptic comes from the Greek word synopsis, which is similar to, you know, your glasses. Kind of, um, you know, uh, something that is looked through the same lens. Soon, optics, opticals. So the same, you know, kind of idea. So you find Matthew writing a story which is similar to what you have in Luke, but with a different emphasis or focus. Because Matthew was writing for a community that was maybe slightly different from the community of Mark or Luke. But these three first uh, three Gospels all share the same symbolic axis. In other words, the same story, but reported or narrated in a different way. I think it's very common to our world today. Three of us can see the same accident on 95. That's, that's, that's my corridor. I drive on that every day. So on I-95, north or south, I see an accident. Brother, you know, Maddox, you also see this. Maybe we're driving together. And, you know, Brother Andrew is also in the car. And we are asked to give a police report. You know there's going to be some differences in the report. You know, the same accident. Why? Because Daniel comes from Ghana. And the way I report things would be different from the way Brother uh, you know, you know, Maddox would do it. You know, Jeff would do it. This, you, know, you know, similarly with, you know, with Andrew. So based on our background or, you know, everything about us, we will report the same incident in a different way. And so that's what the first three Gospels, you know, do. The same story about Jesus, but with, with different emphases, selected, you know, uh, 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 emphases. Now, John is slightly different. The Gospel of John is not part of the synoptics. Because John's story, even though it's about Jesus, John takes it from a different point of view. We all know that when somebody becomes a believer, a new Christian, and they come to you and they ask you, which book should I start to engage with in the New Testament? What would you tell them? There you go. These are not my words. John, everybody you know, in unison, John. Why? Use the mic so that our audience can can hear you. Why do you say John? Can somebody help us understand why you think John? Everybody said John. Why John? Brother Roger, just answer that question for us. I know you have the answer. So you, you, so you got the mic. He's a friend, so I can put him on the spot. Thank you. And if not, you pass it on to Kathy. Kathy also has the answer for us. Well, John was the, probably the closest to Jesus. And Jesus told his mother to, to take John as her okay. son and John to take. Right. Uh, and that's one. That's true. So what Roger is saying, and, uh, and Kathy, add something to it, and I will come back to what Roger said. Why, I was why just going to say because it talks about love. It talks about the love. love of God. Yeah. Okay. Any other perspective about why John? Why do we point new believers who uh, just have embraced the good news of Christ? Well, for your own edification, start with the Gospel of John. Any other perspective? So let me start with what uh, Roger said. When you read the Gospel of John, it is true that at the foot of the cross, when Jesus was about to kind of give up his spirit, as we say, Jesus pointed his mother, Mary, to John, and then that is John, the revelator, or one of the disciples of Jesus, and, and also, um, you know, John to, um, you know, the mother. Mother, here is your son. Son, here is your mother. And from that time, you know, the mother of Jesus lived with John. Uh, history says somewhere maybe in Ephesus. Uh, and so uh, you can see that that kind of you know, connection is there. But also love. The gospel of John is, we call it the spiritual gospel. Uh, you know, one of the church fathers uh, said that, while the first three Gospels emphasize the kind of physicality, the physical history and everything about Jesus, 
John's gospel is a spiritual gospel because it leads the, the reader to a spiritual engagement with Jesus Christ. Love, as you're talking about. So that could be one of them. Yes, Roger. Well, the other thing, John was the only one that wasn't put to death. Okay. He apparently died a natural death. Him and Mary were buried in Ephesus. Okay, so there you go. And so from history, we know that John eventually became the one who wrote the book of Revelation and also the other Johanna and epistles. And uh, obviously, like you're saying, lived to be uh, at an advanced state. Yes, Mary. Uh, well, I think John appeals to our heart. Mark uh, he appeals to our intellect uh -huh. and Matthew to our reasoning. But John appeals to our heart, heart. Mm. which is where we really come to know Jesus. Well, I like that. So, uh, you know, I've been a Bible teacher. I didn't know that. But that's, that's really something new. I'm going to add it to my repertoire of, uh, of, of ideas or something that I know. That's, I like that. So John appeals to the yes, I'm going to write it down, Mary. Thank you. John appeals to our heart, and and Mark to the intellect. Mark is usually referred to as the uh, preacher's gospel, you know. And and for Mark, you notice that everything is really high, you know, fast paced. Boom, 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 boom. And the preacher's gospel, you can stand anywhere, you know, in the corner of uh, uh, of a street and begin to you know kind of talk about uh, uh, John's, uh, you know, Mark's gospel. But John is different. And so I like that, the heart, the intellect. So that's a good one. I think my uh, visitor has something to share. You, Eunice, go ahead, please. It's not working, so I just I think you should be working. Uh, there's something at the bottom that I couldn't get it. you couldn't get it. Yeah. Well, Brother Tree, I think you may need to put new batteries in this. Matthew appeals yeah. to the Jews directly. <laughs> so we can get a, another one. Thank you. Yeah. When I think of John, the Gospel of John, I, I think about that famous verse, uh, yes. John 3.16, uh -huh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think that that is what we point new Christians to. That, that message of hope. Yeah, thank you. I think John 3, 16 are, is the kind of the universal gospel for everybody. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whosoever, everybody is welcome to the table. Let's put it that way. Thank you, Eunice, for that the contribution. Yes, uh, Roger, you were going to say something, so let me give you the mic. He's going to give us a new mic for your table, so let me give this to Roger. That's what we do. We make our discussion interactive. So, go ahead. Well, I just said that Matthew was meant to appeal more directly to the Jews to convince them that right. Jesus was the Christ. Right. Thank you. And so you can see the kind of differences, the nuances, let's put it that way, of the three uh, in the Gospels. Yes, Audra, let me, let's hear from you. Thank you. I had to look this up to confirm it. But um, <laughs> uh, it's our understanding that John was written last and so that John had sort of the, the benefit of what his brethren had recorded okay. before he wrote his gospel. Okay. And so, you know, some, some of the folks who write books, you know, sp explicitly say, like, here is my bias. Yes. I am writing to help convince right. my fellow Jews. Or right. I am writing to help convince you know, the Gentiles, right. or I am writing to help convince those who weren't in the presence of Jesus, like whatever, you know, sometimes they state what their angle is. Right. But sometimes even if they don't state their angle, right. they obviously still have an angle. And so, you know, you can kind of figure that out through the arguments that they make to try to be convincing. Thank you. And that's correct. So, yes, Roger. Well, the argue. other thing is that Luke was the only Gentile to write a gospel. That, that's correct. That's correct. And uh, we, so let me read two uh, verses to complement all the contributions that have been made. Uh, let me start with that of Audra. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And I'm reading from my uh, uh, English Standard Version of the Bible. 
So you follow me in whatever translation you have. John 20, 30, and 31. The purpose of John's book. So here we go. Now Jesus did many other signs. John kind of has this predilection or preference for the word sign instead of miracle. It's the same kind of word, but because the sign reveals something more deeper than just a miracle. Many signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. So here we, you know, we go, why John wrote what he wrote. And again, Sister Eunice, thank you. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have what? Life in his name. John 3, 16. That's the summary of that, clearly. So yes, Sister Audra is right. Uh, you know, others have written. So John comes and he writes what he thinks is kind of to complement those, you know, uh, first three, but in a different you know, kind of way. And so this is really, you know, interesting. Then turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Again, what Roger just said. You see, I don't want these to be my words, but I want scripture to educate us. You know, that's what a, a Bible student does. You go to scripture and let scripture, you know. So Roger said, um, Luke is kind of uh, maybe the only Gentile. We don't even know who wrote Mark. Mark could also have been a Gentile. In fact, some people even said the author of Matthew's gospel could be a, a Gentile who knew, uh, you know, Judaism very well. Again, these are all hypotheses that people put forward. Uh, but what we have is what we have in Scripture. So uh, follow me in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Again, this is very explicit about who and what Luke, you know, was and uh, to kind of agree with what um, you know, Roger said. So let me read. Inasmuch as many have undertaken, Luke 1, verse 1 to verse 4, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning, so listen to this line, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, have delivered them to us. Let me stop there. So what does this say? He wasn't an eyewitness. That's what he's saying. He wasn't there. But some people were there. And they have what? Delivered what they saw and what they heard in their interaction with Jesus to them, including Luke. So now let's continue. It seemed, verse 3, it seemed good to me, that is Luke, also, having followed all things closely from uh, closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So he was an outsider. Clearly, he wasn't there. He wasn't an eyewitness. But he did his own research. And Bible students believe that that was the case because the name mentioned there, Theophilus, from the Greek means Theos, Philos, or Phileo, a lover of God. Was this person a real, you know, kind of human person, or is it a symbolic name? Whichever way you look at it, it makes sense. So if he was a real person, Bible students believe that he was probably the underwriter. He was the one who underwrote Luke's research kind of allow Luke to be able to do his research and be able to write what he wrote you know, for us. So kind of a benefactor. So Luke, Luke becomes a beneficiary of this Theophilus. But if it's also a symbolic name, then he's saying all lovers of God. Theo, Phileo. So Theophilus, the name Theophilus means God's lover, somebody who loves God. So if you have your son or family member by name Theophilus, that's what it means. And so Luke is saying all lovers of God, this is something that you can benefit from. And so, again, to agree with what Roger said, he wasn't an eyewitness. But he also wrote based on the kind of research that he did. Which makes the Bible so exciting. Very diverse, but also something that we can relate to. Because God used human instrumentalities like you and I actually write God's word with the help of the Holy Spirit. Roger. Well, the other thing interesting about Luke, he was a physician, and there's really no report that he 
did anything but support other people and support right. Paul and, yeah. and so that forth. That is true. Thank you. The beloved the physician, Luke, he was the doctor. And by the way, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and also the, the second sequel, which is Acts of the Apostles. And we all know that because when you go to Acts chapter 1, the same kind of introduction that we read in uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 4 of Luke's Gospel is repeated almost verbatim. So in my first volume, he says, so if you go to Acts chapter 1 and you read, you notice the continuity, the link between the, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Yes. Well, the other thing that's interesting about Luke, he was the first pastor of Philippi. Okay. And Philippi is the one church that's not criticized anywhere in the Bible. That's correct. You know, um, uh, and that is also true because Paul wrote, if you read the book of, of Philippians, it's a beautiful letter. It's a letter full of joy. The word joy preponderates. In other words, it's just, it fills out that whole letter. Joy in the Lord. Joy, and that was... The, um, the church, as uh, Roger Riley says, that supported all, you know, Paul's ministry and all of that. So there's a lot in the, in the, in the Bible that we cannot actually, um, 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 you know, exhaust in terms of, of studying. So this is what we're talking about, about the New Testament. So let me just, again, uh, highlight one or two things. Uh, the next line after what I, um, you know, where I ended, historical evidence, so page 23. Historical evidence indicates that the earliest Christian generations were mainly eschatological in orientation. And one thing that I do in my book is I try to explain everything, all those high-sounding theological terms that we in academia or in the seminary take for granted. You know, so that's kind of the neat thing about this book that I've written. I try to explain every detail that I, I don't assume anything. I don't take anything for granted. So you hear the word eschatology. What does that mean? The word eschatology is simply in Greek, end time things, kind of things that are going to happen at the end. And so, you know, the early Christians believed that Jesus was coming in their generation. In fact, even Paul. And so I have over there the, that greeting in Aramaic, Maran, Arthur, come Lord Jesus. So that was how they greeted each other because they felt that Jesus was coming. Uh, and so it was... The early Christian movement was eschatological in orientation because they believed that Jesus was coming. But then something occurred. Well, Jesus didn't show up. He came through the incarnation, but they were expecting him to come the second time and take them home because of all the persecutions. But Jesus didn't come. And so they realized that, ah, oh, we have work to do. And so you notice know, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but remain in Jerusalem. And you will receive power. And then you will become what? My witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Thank God that he didn't come when the early church was expecting him. Because otherwise you and I wouldn't be beneficiaries of the gospel. So God has worked for us. So you and I, it's our turn. The early disciples and the early uh, you know, followers of Jesus did their part. You and I also need to do our part. That is why... When you become a believer and God has blessed you with the knowledge of his you know, salvation, you can't, you can't sit still. You need to share that gospel with others. Mary. I was just going to say, there's a Maranatha church over on Annandale Road. So there you go. So that church is taking that name, Maranatha it's church. It's been there for 30, 40, 50 years. Bless more. you. Wow. So that they, they're living out this kind of understanding. Come, Lord Jesus. And because we want Jesus to come, what do we do? We share love. We actually are about spreading the good news of salvation. We do everything that, you know, and so this, uh, on the faith, we're coming to do, uh, you know, uh, hunger, where we're going to pack, you know, food. And Audra will talk more about it, you know, uh, with, with the group that we'll be leading. Uh, and we want everybody to be part of that, because that's part of what? Spreading the joy, the good news of salvation, as we pack, you know, food and we send it out to those who are in dire need. And so all those things that we do, and Mary, thank you that there's this church called Maranatha Church because they're living out that uh, you know, kingdom. And so um, as the early church kind of um, um, uh, experienced this delay, they realized that something needed you know, to be done. And then when you turn to page 24, uh, we discuss the different uh, types of literature in the New Testament. 
first of all, letters. And so look at uh, page 24, the first uh, you know, paragraph there. There are four types of literature represented in the New Testament. Four Gospels, okay? One semi-historical book, what we call Book of Acts of the Apostles. And we'll talk a little bit about it. 21 letters or epistles. And then one book of Apocalypse, book of Revelation. So kind of in a summary format. The New Testament, the 27 books. We know that uh, in the Christian uh, Bible or the Protestant Bible, there are 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, making a total of 66. And out of the 27 books in the New Testament, we have four Gospels. We have one kind of semi-book of uh, history, arts. It's not history per se. We actually call it uh, historiography, kind of uh, being you know, written in the form of history, but it's actually more than that. And then we have 21 letters. So think about it. 21 out of the 24. And then the book of uh, Revelation. Apocalypse. So the question is, why 21 letters? And you'll see a little bit of discussion when you read it, so you, I will leave you to read that, but le just let me uh, uh, summarize it for you. Letters or letter writing was kind of the easiest way to actually communicate with people that were far away from you, even though it wasn't as easy or kind of uh, simple as we have it you know, today, but it was still kind of the easiest way where you can get on a horse or maybe go on a boat or a ferry and then take the letter to another you know, um, a group of people or churches. And so Paul, so that's number one. Number two, the reason why we have more letters is that Paul, as we know, became the first itinerant missionary who took the gospel. He wasn't part of the original group, but Paul's itinerary was all over the place especially in those biblical lands that we know, uh, you know, modern-day Turkey, all those areas where he blitzed, where he actually took the gospel. And so it's no, it's no surprise that letters will be kind of, you know, the, uh, the one that is actually the most in terms of genre in the New Testament. In fact, even among the letters, there are also others, other classifications that we can look at. And this is just mainly among academics or Bible students who just want to, to dialogue and just talk. And so, again, you don't need to take that seriously, but some Bible students do that. Among the 21 letters, we are told that there are about maybe seven or eight that Paul himself wrote or Paul himself contributed in a major way. And then the remaining, obviously, just bear Paul's um, name because, you know, we use the word eponymous kind of the significance of a name, upon him. Just like when you have the name Moses, big. And so you have the Pentateuch, and they name it the, 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 the writings of Moses because the name Moses is big. Similarly, the name Paul. And so there are these kind of, you know, seven letters that Bible students believe Paul obviously wrote or may have had a major contribution, not in any order of, um, uh, of historicity, but... We, we have uh, the book of Romans, 1 and 2, you know, Corinthians. We also have uh, Philemon. We also have, uh, you know, Philippians. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so these are kind of the, you know, letters that most, uh, you know, students believe Paul actually wrote. I have all of them listed there. Then the remaining uh, books... Some say, well, Paul may have had some contribution, but Paul wasn't really the author. And so the first one that he wrote, we call them proto-Pauline. The word proto means first, genuine, authentic. And then the other one, the others like uh, uh, the Colossians, Ephesians, Second Thessalonians, and then you know, the remaining, they will you know, name them uh, deutero-Pauline, second. This is just mere classification. Uh, and so we know that all these books that bear Paul's name, we say the letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus. Paul's letter to, you know, uh, the Colossians. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians and, and those kind of things. But that's what scholars actually, you know, do. So it's just good for you to be uh, aware of those, uh, you know, classifications. So let me stop here 
Any comment, any question on what we've talked about so far? Anything that you want us to explain a little bit or just highlight before we move on? Remember what I said when I was studying? My professor would tell me, or tell us as students, after a lecture, and you, he would pause and say, any comments or questions? And the class went dead. So there's only you know, two things. Either you, I did a good job that you understood everything I taught perfectly, or it went just above your head. You, you, didn't, you, know, you didn't actually you know, grasp anything, or you didn't capture anything. Well, hopefully, that's not where we are. So any comment or any question on what we've talked about so far? Or contribution. Right. So let me speak about the term anonymity. There are two words that are used in the Bible or in Bible studies, pseudonymity and anonymity. A pseudonym and something being anonymous. We know what these words mean in, in the English language. Um, so let's use the word anonymity. Kind of writing without any name. Now, Bible students believe that the books that we even call the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, uh, Mark and John were actually written anonymously in the original language without any name. The names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John kind of were attached later on during um, kind of the Christian era, you know, the time when these books were actually being uh, studied and uh, and so they thought, well, Matthew being, you know, uh, a disciple of Jesus would have done this. Uh, Luke would have done this and all of that. But in the original kind of, you know, uh, manuscripts, you know, they, we didn't have any names on that. But, hey, even if Christian tradition attributed these names, they're still valid. And so that's really what we have. So that's kind of anonymity without any name. Pseudonym. Pseudo. False. False name. So some people are saying the other protopauline books uh, were probably not written by Paul, but they were given the name Paul. So in other words, those who wrote put Paul's name there because Paul's name was very, very uh, you know, precious and acceptable. Now somebody may ask, so does that make it not good or corrupted? Absolutely not. Anonymity and pseudonymity were very common practices in antiquity when people wrote. We even say that uh, John the Revelator wrote the book of Revelation. We say that. But do we really, are we really sure that it was John? We don't know, but that's the name. And so all that I'm saying is the fact that we don't know who the original writers or names were does not in any way detract from the sanctity from the value of the Bible as God's word, which is able to help us, which is able to give us you know, salvation. And so you will see that these two words, anonymity and pseudonymity, will be discussed, and you may be reading about it in different uh, you know, forms, and I want you to be aware that you know, some people take it too far. But the fathers, this is how I explain it to my students and you know, to people that I engage in Bible study with. We serve a God who is beyond our understanding. First of all, God is sovereign, the sovereignty of God. He does what he does. Nobody can question God. Secondly, God can use human instruments like you and, 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 and I and, or me to do anything for, you know, for God. And so, the fact that we don't even know the names of, the original names of these individuals to me, adds to the mystique, the mystery of the Bible. The Bible is mysterious. It's God's word. And, you know, much as we would try to appreciate and to understand the Bible, we will never get to the bottom of it. The Bible is new every day. When you, you know, the same passage that you've read, come back to it the next day, and it's what? It speaks to you in a new, in a new and different way. Because it's, it's God's word. It's mysterious. And so I think everything about God's word is mysterious. But the good news is this God of mystery has chosen to reveal himself to fallen, sinful human beings like you and me. And that's the beauty of the Christian you know, gospel. That God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for, you know, faulty people like all of us so that he can take us 
mold us, recreate us, and make us into his likeness one more time. And so I am so thankful that I'm not able to fully comprehend, fully understand God's word. Because the moment I, I claim to understand God fully, and then I'm almost on the same level as God, which is, you know, blasphemous. It's sacrilegious. Because I will forever, eternally remain God's creation, and God will be the creator. And we need to actually make those lines of demarcation clear. Don't let us blur those lines. The moment we kind of cross these lines, we get ourselves into all kinds of, of trouble. And that's what's going on in our world. I've said this here before, because there are people who, this new age movement, we are little gods. We can understand God. No. There's no way that you and I can fully comprehend God. And I think it's good for us that way. That's why we're able to go to God. Just imagine your child, a little baby that is born, and all that that baby knows is the mother, mother's voice, everything about the mother. You know, and the child is growing. When I was growing up, I knew that my father was the strongest person on earth, that nobody could touch me because my father was there. As a little boy, that's, that's what I believe. So if, if I run into trouble, I run to him. You know, until I uh, go and say, oh, uh, physically there are other people who are stronger than, than my dad, but that's okay. But you see, that kind of understanding gave me hope and confidence to grow up, knowing that I'm in an environment where I am protected. So mom and dad, you know, look, you smack your child or you kind of say, hey, don't do that. And the child gets upset and goes, after a little while, where does the child go? They come back to you because you are the security for them. There's nowhere for them to go. I think similarly we can kind of see the same thing with God. No matter what happens to us, no matter how much we think we know about God, he's still our creator, he's still our redeemer, he's everything. And he's the one that we go to when we are in trouble. Let me pause here for, for today, and you can see we still haven't finished the New Testament. So we'll come back next week and continue. There's a lot for us to study, so I will encourage you to keep reading. Any comment, any questions so far on what we've read this morning or what we've talked about? Any comment? This is the forum. This is a place where you can ask all kinds of questions, which you cannot do in your Sunday school because you think, ah, you don't have faith in God. Here, nobody will criticize you. So ask whatever question is on your mind. Yes. Uh, you see, uh, all the books that they have discovered uh, through history, and they're in different languages. Uh, how, do you, how do you explain that if, you know, if it's all verbal? About, about the Bible? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. So the question that uh, Brother Ed is asking is, you know, the Bible has been translated in all kinds of languages, Coptic, Akkadian, uh, Syriac, you know, all of that. And they're, they're many and varied. Yeah. You know, uh, textual critics have actually done a good job. People who have learned the ancient languages have really pulled their hearts and soul into studying all of this. And yes, we do have all of that. Now, the reason for the multiplication or multiplicity of all these books is that, you know, as people had access to the, the Bible, the original the kind of, uh, and by the way, we don't even have the original books, as we know, because most of them were lost in the, in, the, in the Jewish Roman War and all of that. But what they did was they tried to translate into all these different languages, which is giving rise to what we call manuscripts. So there's so many manuscripts. The good thing about these manuscripts is that they actually help us. As these people who have studied all these ancient languages pour, you know, kind of, uh, you know, themselves over these books or try to study them, we're able to see the similarities and differences, which all help us. And so the, the answer to your question is, we may not be able to get to the original manuscript. We don't know. But what we have is multiple translations into different languages, which all help us, at least, to see the storyline. And so they're actually there for a reason, and they're good you know, for us. And so we encourage people to read some of the apocryphal writings, encourage people to read you know, everything that you can lay your hands on. It's okay, but stay close to the Bible. That's your primary source. But you're also welcome to, and we encourage students to actually do that. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Any other comment or question? Yes. Yeah. Kathy. I just wondered about their education. I guess Matthew was educated because he was a tax collector. Luke was educated because he was a doctor. But like John and Mark, like weren't these fishermen and 
Good question. How were they schooled? And good, good question. And, and you know, uh, you, you remember in the book of Acts when these men were arraigned, when they were brought before the council, this hindrance, and some of them were saying, but are these not fishermen? Uneducated. And yet, how are they able to speak so powerfully and boldly and, and make so much sense? And so they marveled. Well, two things. You're right. Not all of them were that educated. But most of them were actually fairly police. You know, they could maybe talk or read. But also, in, in antiquity, if somebody had some money, because remember, the sons of Zebedee, being fishermen, means they were people of kind of little substance or means. So they could maybe have some people to help them. But the good news is, that's why I was saying to you, that the way the Bible came about, you know, we may have some kind of people helping others to write through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible is God's book for everybody and is written in a way that only God can explain to us in a way. Even though God used 40 human instruments, as I keep saying. And so how do we answer that question? Well, to answer that question, if even the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish ruling court at the time, could testify or offer this testimony, but that these people are up to something. They are not educated. And then they said, well, because they've been with Jesus. And so being with Jesus was their education. And so they were able to write, at least with some help from others. You know, like when I wrote this book, I just wrote what I understood, and then it has to go through some kind of system. You had to have a, an, an editor who will kind of, you know, I write with the British kind of English in mind, and it has to be stepped down to the American English in some way, so that, you know, so the, that's, that's the work of my editor. My editor helped me to kind of put those kind of, you know, uh, things in the, in the proper, you know, format. It, it's possible, but the good news is that they were Educated because they've been with Jesus Christ. I don't think there's anything more for me to say. <laughs> That's Roger. Well, the other thing about Mark was he was really a protege of Peter. That's correct. In addition to going on the mission trips with That's Paul correct. and Silas. Yeah, the book of Acts confirms that. So thank you for that. Well, interesting study, and um, we can keep going on, but uh, we need to bring this to an end. So uh, we came to page 25. We'll continue next week, uh, and we're going to end our time so that we can have our time of fellowship uh, and uh, also the, this uh, coffee, and uh, there's also uh, other things out there where, uh, which you can you know, kind of uh, chew on. So let's uh, bring our time to a close, and let's uh, have our time of fellowship. Father, we thank you for this morning and for this hour and for what you've taught us. Help us to be diligent students of your word. And help us to be a blessing to those who need to hear of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Bless us now as we interact and as we fellowship together, we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all and thank you our virtual audience. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>